Sure. This is Jim Keen from the Boston Bulldogs Running Club in Boston, Massachusetts. This is episode 280 of the Club Culture Trail Running Podcast. From the belly of the Beast Coast, Glastonbury, Connecticut, this is the Culture Trail Running Podcast. We talk about all the fun shit that happens on the trails that most normal people don't care about. The language we use is f***ing explicit and raw like the trails we run on. So don't listen with your kids! kids. Cultural is brought to you by our Patreons and supporters. We are 112% listener supported and support is good. All right, all right, all right. Well, welcome everybody to the Culture Trail Running Podcast. I'm your host, Art Byram, and I am joined tonight by the Culture Crew. I have Fred Marolo. I'm here. I'm trying to figure out what thing explicit means. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it is. It's it's borderline. It's thing, right? It is. It is. All right. It's All probably right. a French word. Yes, yeah, it could be a French word. Thing. <clears throat> yes. Okay. So when you hear that, if you're offended by that, um, excuse our French. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There you go. See what I did there? Yeah. Ah, I like that. Okay. Um, we also have Celeste Fong, a ding dong. Good morning. Welcome. Welcome back, Celeste. I mean, I'd say it's great to be back, but I was on a cruise ship, so. Yeah. I'm, I'm surprised you don't have like an eye patch and like a parrot on, <laughs> and like a parrot on your shoulder at this point. He does have a little bit of a tan, though. You can see that. <laughs> I, I it's, it's, yeah, it's bad. I think that, yeah, it was an interesting week. We had a good time. Good. Did not cause an international incident, so and that you know of, and right, and the boat didn't sink. That we know of, mm. it did not sink. Although they did play, I don't even know what's that song from Titanic. They played that on the ship, <laughs> which was kind of not in good taste. But we laughed because we're inappropriate. But they told you that your ship was unsinkable, though, so it was all cool, right? Yeah, no problem, not a chance. Yeah. And I. We were, we were, you know, down in Mexico. So at least icebergs were off the table. Mm, it's a different yeah. world right now. You don't know. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> Any, That's anything true. can happen. Um, okay. So enough of this, uh, enough of this childish prattling here. Uh, tonight joining us, we have Dr. Jim Keen or Kane. I'm sorry. I think I pronounced that wrong. No, you're, you're right. The first time it's Keen. Keen. Okay. Yeah. Not yeah. like uh, the, the governor... Uh, the old governor of New Jersey, right? Yes, yes. Okay. Tom Kane. Tom Kane. Right? Tom Kane. Tom Kane. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so you're with the uh, Boston Bulldogs, right? Right, right. You're the so executive the director, right? That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the, ball, the Boston Bulldogs, it's a, it's an innovative peer-to-peer -peer collective of of recovering drug and alcohol abusers and their allies, and mm -hmm. we use this fellowship of the road to provide support and solidarity to others like ourselves. Very good. Very good. So are you a, um, I, I always like to find out about the, you know, who we're speaking to now. So uh, are you a runner or were you ever involved in running? Or Yeah, I was. Mm -hmm. um, I'm an amateur runner. Uh, I ran the Boston Marathon three times. Um, okay. uh, I qualified for New York. I ran a host of half marathons and I'm a former track coach. I did high school, high school cross country track coach for maybe six years or so, but uh, art, I had hip surgery. And oh. uh, so my running days are kind of, well, they're not like they used to be. Mm. Well, they say um, uh, pacing and crewing is uh, crewing and pacing is better than racing. Better than <laughs> racing. Right. So, um, <clears throat> so, okay. So, but you ran Boston three times. That's uh, that's, that's not nothing, right? I mean, yeah, not all on the same day though. You know, okay. it was well, okay. yeah, separate okay. days. Yeah. Th yeah. That, that was, would make you an ultra runner, Jim. If you exactly. Did. exactly. Right? That was, That'd be an ultra runner. That yeah. was our episode a couple weeks ago. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, all right. So, uh, so how did, where did you grow up then? So I grew up in Needham, Massachusetts. Okay. And I went to oh, school like a in long Boston. way from Boston. Way long way. way far away. Yeah. Long way. And yeah. um, so I grew up knowing about the race, always wanted to run Boston. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I don't I, I actually haven't shared this with the Bulldogs, but um I'd always wanted to run the Bo the Boston Marathon. 
Uh, and the first time I did it, I I was in a bar at two o'clock in the morning and decided, oh, my God, today's the Boston Marathon. I'm going to run the Boston Marathon. Oh. Yeah. So I, I wouldn't recommend that. Yeah. So so I finished. I, I finished. But um, the next year I said, I'm going to do this for real. And mm-hmm. and then I I did a very decent time. I think my best time was I don't think I broke three tw- three and a half. I, it might have been like three hours and 33 minutes. OK. All right. Yeah. yeah decent, so that's but not great. Yeah, cranking yeah. out eight minute, yeah. eight yeah. minute eight miles, minute miles. And miles. stopping at a yeah. water station here and there. Right. Yeah. Like every now and then. Well, it was, it, it was a while ago, you know, so it was um, they 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 gave out erg on the side and I was alternating water and erg and um uh, everything has changed now, you know, so yeah. much has changed about running now, you know, and it's much more, you know, I, I didn't, I, you know, I, I gave no thought to eat, to nutrition or what I was going to eat on the right, you know, mm. um, what I wore, I just pulled out of a closet and put it on, you know, right on. Yeah. So this is like, this is good. I would too bad. Joe Lasky's hundo Joe's not here. Right. I mean, he'd be yeah. just Loving this. this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, so what year? What year was this? Or when? When it was eighty nineteen eighty six, nineteen eighty six, and then I ran in eighty seven and eighty eight as well, and okay. I qualified for New York, but didn't actually run New York. Mm, okay, yeah. and that's a harder uh, thing. I mean, I, I know it is right now. Is it, was that harder than Boston to qualify for? Uh, I didn't have to qualify for Boston when I was doing it. You, oh, okay. you could you could just jump in, and so I did. I I, was, yeah. I just you know bit, banded yeah. it, and then gotcha. um, that was part uh, of the tradition there for all you people at home who are thinking yeah. you're going to go rip off a race. You'll probably get thrown in jail if you try it, or um, you know a, a trooper will take you down. But um, that was part of the. Uh, maybe you could talk about that a little bit, Jim. What, what was the it, the bandit culture? Uh, it was the lore. You know, it was um, it, you know. Running was just, I mean, running, running had taken off. And, and I, in, I have to tell you this, I, so I left the bar around two o'clock in the morning. Uh, and I, I had a, I had a few old Milwaukee's coursing through my veins, but when I came home, I, I read a chapter from the complete book of running by Jane, by Jim Fix. Jim if Fix you know the book. Sure. Oh yeah. And there, there's a chapter there about running the Boston marathon. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I I read it and kind of like memorized that chapter and it it goes frame by frame, mile by mile. You know, now you're passing through Ashland. There's really? a, I, I think and there's a there's a there's a hardware store and look at the look in the mirror and watch your stride, you know, and then. So, you know, and now you're coming into Wellesley and, and the girls of Wellesley are going to form a gauntlet and they're going to be cheering at you, you know, and it was fan- and everything he said. It happened just that way. Oh, no kidding. So I. Yeah. I think that might have been the first running book that I ever read. Yeah. Because I went, I think that I, uh, I went to the live and this was well before I was the amazing runner that I am now. Of course. Of course. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> it was, yeah, it was, I, I went and I read this book and um, I, I just bought into everything that it said and like, you know, right away, um, yeah, the complete book. Of, yeah, that was. Well, you know, you know, so interesting is that I remember uh, in junior high school and in high school running and it was still a novelty. I remember I'd go in the mo- early morning or late at night when people couldn't see me mm-hmm. because when fewer running it was like, what's the problem? What'd you steal? What <laughs> what happened? You know, and um Later on, as an adult, I um, I traveled to China extensively, and mm-hmm. I would run in China. And let me tell you, they didn't know running either. It was <laughs> just like being in junior high school. They thought you were running from the police or something, you know? Gotcha, gotcha. So, yeah. Fred, did you, can you identify with any of this? Yes, I can. Mm. Yeah, I started running in 1975. So uh, when, when Boston <laughs> Billy finally became famous... Yeah, Celeste wasn't born yet. When Boston Billy <laughs> I was born famous. in 1975. There you go. There you I was, go. I was yeah. a runner. I thought it was awesome. I, I tried to qualify for the Boston Marathon a bunch of times. Never did until 2001 when I was turning 45. I finally qualified. But uh, yeah, it was, uh, those were the good times. Mm. Yeah. Very good. Lots Very of, good. Lots of cotton clothes too. 
Nike waffle trainers and cotton uh, running shorts. Yeah. And the Asics Tigers. and <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I had Asics, Asics Tigers. Yeah. But I, I mean, you know, Fred, I, what has, what has developed since like in, in terms of proper clothing, proper shoes, it's just, it's mm. frightening what people used to do. I, I, I yeah. think, I think Jim Kelly ran in work boots. Yeah. Yeah. I think he did. And, you know, you know so and Jim, I can remember when I was first starting to run marathons in 1978, there was a debate as to whether or not you should drink water during the marathon. Of course. Because you cramp up. Food. Should you drink water or because like it may give you cramps? You know? yes. Yeah. 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 Oh, I, 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 you know, I, I did that. I know that. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. And then, the, the, uh, Fred, did you have a pasta dinner the night before? Yeah. <laughs> Very yeah. calm, right? Build the carbos, yep. you know. Oh, yeah. 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 Really interesting. Jeez. I mean, I know that in my gym class, they would, uh, like, they would tell you, like, you could drink water, you couldn't drink water, or then there were, like, salt pills were the other thing. Um, and then all yeah, of a sudden it was pills. like, what? what's that, Fred? I said, oh, yeah, salt pills. There, there was the reason the, the no drink water thing was somebody, I can't remember who it was, um, had finished a an international marathon in a really good pace without drinking any water. And everybody was like, oh, that's the way to do it. And mm. like, what an that, awful, what an awful like, example. Yeah. It's like my style, yeah. right? Yeah. I like, if I, if I run a half a mile, I lose like half a pound. <laughs> so on a hot day. So, you know, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, yeah. So there was, I guess things were a little bit different. So, um, hmm. Yeah. Cause they also told you like, yeah, you can't do any exercise cause yeah, you'll cramp up because of the water. Like I've, I wonder how they got that. Like I've never literally never cramped on water. I mean, right. Yeah. I mean, well, these are the same people are who thought that a woman's, uh, like uterus would fall out if they ran more than 3000 meters too. Mm. So, you know, I mean, it's not like, like running medicine was really, yeah. locked so, in yeah. at that point yeah that doesn't yeah. happen for mile six yeah thanks <laughs> exactly thanks, right. celeste right. celeste tell us about the time your uterus fell out please go ahead as a woman <laughs> yep, whose ahead. uterus actually did fall out <laughs> yes it wasn't during running so oh, there's that <laughs> ah so not running causes <laughs> yeah. your uterus to fall out not running so That's my right. uterus fell out before I started running. So running has saved my uterus. So Okay, good. Starting running. Good to hear. <laughs> All right. You sacrificed your uterus. <laughs> I, yeah, that was painful, but I digress. Very good. That was oh. more painful than running. Mm, really? I think so. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was very painful. Well, you know what? I asked Jordan said that the cut 112 was more painful than childbirth. Um. I'll let you know when I'm done with it. No, okay. say, geez, I doubt got it. it coming up. So let you know. Okay. Just, cool. yeah. I mean, there's that, yeah. right. <laughs> there's that to look forward to. So, um, okay. what else? so then how did you actually start running then, Jim? So I, when I was a kid, so, you know, I got into it as a kid. Um, I have, I have what, what you might call as a bit of an addictive personality. Mm -hmm. And, um, <laughs> and, and I was I was very much into marijuana when I was in high school and, and very much into alcohol when I was in college. Mm -hmm. um, and somewhere along the line, I, I just kind of moved over and I I gave up something and took on running. And that became a very smart thing to do. And in the Bulldogs, a lot of that is what we do. It's 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 yes, you could just say, you know, abstinence. I'm not going to do drugs. We're not going to do alcohol it might make more sense to give something up and take something on something mm. like running, you know, that has, um, that allows endorphins to kick in that can help alleviate anxiety and depression. And, um, there's a lot of camaraderie in the bulldogs too, a sense of community. Mm -hmm. And I think those two things become running and community become very useful recovery tools and maybe yes. just lifelong tools, life, life tools. Yeah. If you think about it, um, I, so I'm in recovery myself, um, uh, 40 plus years at this Holy point. Holy cow. It, Congratulations. Wow. Thank you. I, yeah, I was, when I was 18 years old, I, um, I, I stopped drinking. So the, um, but the, 
the thing that one of the big issues that I had with stopping drinking or the, even the thought of it was like, who are my friends going to be? Yeah. Who, who am I if yeah. I'm not like party, hardy, arty, <laughs> you know, yeah. the guy who can like, yeah. you know, I couldn't drink yeah. very much, but. <laughs> and, and, or art, the question is it's boring. Yeah. You know, it's like sobriety is so boring mm-hmm. and um, it's actually, you know, who knew it's yeah. not. Yep. It's and, not. And it's yeah, not, and yeah. Didn't... Once you learn, once you get on the other side of it, it's really, uh, it's not that at all, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so great not to be hungover. Wow, mm. who knew? Who knew? <laughs> I I can't imagine uh, being hungover because like some mornings I wake up and I still feel like really bad <laughs> now, and I just can't imagine like if I were like if I were feeling like that hungover, like I I just can't imagine the tolerance. I don't know. You know, I, I can't even imagine dealing with that. Um, so, uh, so yeah. So tell us then like about your, you know, so you stopped, did you start running right when you stopped drinking? Is that right? No, or, no, or did was, you stop drinking or like, was it, um, I, I guess like the question is, um, do you consider yourself to be in recovery? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so it's, it's kind of a longer story. Running exercise was always part of my life. Um, and, but I've always had this kind of addictive part to me. Uh, sure. I'm a workaholic also. Mm-hmm. And, um, the workaholism and in, in, in AA, it's like workaholism, dear God, what the hell does that mean? You know, but, but trust me, I wouldn't, I wouldn't wish it on anybody. Um, but the workaholism meant I needed a hip, hip replacement and um, I I started to self medicate because mm. I wouldn't give up work. I I couldn't take time away to mm. recover, so um, I wound up um, pretty much addicted to opioids, and mm. and that was part of my undoing. So um, uh, and and very you know a very destructive you know way to manage your pain. Um, so I wound up eventually doing it, it, it caused other issues with my back and stuff like that. And I was in agony. I was in agony. Um, and then the other curious thing about opio- opioids is that they don't necessarily address physical pain. They might also address emotional pain that you weren't even aware of. Mm. And I, I think that's probably what was going on with me. And, mm. um, and, 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 with any compulsivity like drugs or alcohol or shopping or dieting or eating or, or your phone or, or sex or whatever it is. Um, it, it's usually, it's, whoa, it's whoa, wait a minute, but don't, don't put sex. sex in there. Not sex. Oh, right? Like no, sex is okay. Not, right. No, sex is fine. Okay. But, all right. All right. But, no, no, no. Okay. no I, keep I going. Misspoke. According I, to I, I just, like, you know, you just, you triggered I me. For a minute. <laughs> so, so, but, but it's almost like whatever that compulsivity is, it's usually filling some kind of hole that mm. happened a while ago. Yes. And, yes. and so when you yeah. stop drinking, you stop alcohol, you have to start filling that hole. Yes. You know? Yes. Yeah. That's, that's absolutely, I, I would agree with that a hundred percent in that, um, you know, with uh, uh, people, I, you know, myself having an addictive personality, I need to have whatever that is to make me feel okay about myself and make sure. me feel on some level that that issue is is not there you know that sadness of childhood or that um you know just that whatever it is that's you know that's there is just um not being not not being dealt with and and you know like like sometimes, you know, you could do like, you know, like you said, you can work and you're like, oh, you know what? I just sold this big job or I just figured out this amazing project. And like somebody, you know, anybody who could do this couldn't possibly be that bad, you know, yeah. or couldn't, you know, so it's, um, you, it does build. It, you, certain activities feed us, you know, mm. they, they feed your brain, they feed your emotion, something like that. And, and my hunch is, when you think of it that way, most people have some sort of addiction and it, mm. it might be food. It might be praise. You know, it, mm-hmm. we, we're addicted to certain, you know, it could be sugar, you know, yes. um, yeah, yeah. you know, 
And, and and some of it I think is just inherent in not now I know you're like you're probably not the guy to duel with as far as um, like philosophy and things like that but like uh, I, if you think about it part of it is like the human condition you know if you think back to our our ancient history as sus- sustenance hunters um, for you know hypothetically or in reality our existence was like a miserable one, you know, being hungry quite often, going long stretches of time, not getting what we need, not getting maybe proper shelter. And then all of a sudden we would go on this sustenance hunt and it would be successful. And then we would get that food Mm -hmm. and we would get the hunt was there. And all of a sudden we were saving our village and we were the, we were the big guy on campus. And we were that, we were that, animal that we want to be. And um, anytime I, I, so I think that there's an inherent need for people, uh, for people to do difficult things in order to get satisfaction. Okay. And we were binging art too. We were binging. Yeah. When we got our, you, when you we caught that elk, we were going to eat the whole eats thing. so much they can barely stand it. Right. So you're binging. Oh. Hmm. But, but now there's no barrier to entry. Like, there's like carcasses all over the place that we yes. can scavenge and, yeah. and gnaw the bones of, right? Yep. All those all those brains to eat. You know? hey, can I just say something? I would like to say that Jim is my most interesting interviewee of the last like six months. And why would that be, Fred? I, because you're really speaking some interesting truths, Jim. I really thank you. Thank really, you. And also, you're kind of in my age group, so exactly. <laughs> so I like that. Too. Exactly. <laughs> that's that's right. You got to pay it forward, there, Fred. Yep. You know? Yeah. So very good. So well, I, I just want to pick up on that that idea. I, I'm I've been thinking a lot about running, and I'm wondering if if running is not a a self healing mechanism. Um, mm. That creates a kind of mental, emotional, and physical equilibrium. And and I, I think that we see it in the Bulldogs, like people need this. I think our society needs it more than it's ever needed. It. And yeah. and maybe it's because of COVID, but, but anxiety, depression, it's on the surface now. People wear it on their sleeves. And I, I think running is a way to kind of reset our, our compass, Mm. our equilibrium. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And it's, um, it's, it's also another, I mean, and and part of, and it's all those things and it's been those things since you've been running, right. In a, in a lot of ways, but it's even more so now because it has the added, you know, people used to talk to each other and hang out and, um, and do things together and, and they don't so much anymore. I'm not saying there's, communities all over the place that do certainly there's people who have ultimate oh. frisbee clubs hiking clubs and different things like that but but running you're going with you get to meet in real life nobody's you can't talk on your phone when you're running for the most part um although we do see we see people try no i, I i'm totally agreeing with you i but yeah. I, I think it's it's more serious than that i i think we are created in community we are mm-hmm. formed in community and what we see in our society today is community is disintegrating. Mm-hmm. There's no, there's no bowling leagues. People don't do bridge night. They're not. No one's going to church like they were. It community is fraying, and so like mm-hmm. a, a, you wind up with other communities. Running clubs become, you know, a really important alternative. Yeah. Really important. Yeah, that's that is interesting. I mean, um, the. Uh, I was going to say the secretary general, the, um, the, uh, uh, the surgeon, the surgeon general, right. That's who he is, right. Surgeon general, um, uh, declared a, uh, loneliness epidemic. Yeah. And, and has just said that a national, it's a national health crisis that people are lonely, that they don't like, they don't have people don't have a lot of people just don't have friends and don't have people that they can actually talk to. Yeah, uh, can I give you a statistic? Yeah, please. In nineteen in the nineteen nineties, they asked people how many how many feel that they have no close personal friends, and that number was less than three percent. That mm. was in nineteen in the nineteen nineties. Today, that number is twelve percent. Wow, twelve wow. percent of adult Americans feel like they have no close personal friends. Mm. 
and if it, it just goes on like you know yeah I, I it is a, i think it's a very serious issue yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and and yeah because it, it seems like it's so and one one thing that i heard about this was that it's also the difference between um satisfaction and pleasure right where some people are just you know you can go on if you want pleasure you can go on facebook and just see it see something and it's good and you like it and it doesn't take any effort and you can go on to the next thing and see that and it it doesn't it's like getting a sugar high like there's no effort involved with getting it and you just get that shot and you move on to the next one and then at the end you're just like sick to your stomach and and your head hurts and you feel bad about yourself yeah but because it doesn't take any effort you know there's no um so there's no satisfaction in the whole process um but something like running or making a personal a real life personal connection with people it does take effort because it's it's a little bit awkward and it doesn't always feel like you know you're kind of putting yourself out there like well what am i going to say you know and and uh you know i don't know it might be there might be a moment of silence or something yeah i mean especially among addicts um they tend to isolate they mm. self-isolate you know we we withdraw we don't want to be in community um mm. and we have to be kind of pulled in um i do have you were saying something very interesting that made me think that i think i think suffering um can do two things to us. It can either break us or break us open. Mm. And and I, I think that that might be part of what running is doing. Certainly recovery is that you know, you have to, in recovery, you, you, you hit the ground, you know, you, you're shattered um, and, and, and it can break you and it has broken people, but it can mm -hmm. also be an open opportunity to break you open to, to allow you to grow and, yeah. and you grow through community, through that connection. Yeah. Yeah. It's very rare in therapy. Um, and that's something I, I take advantage of. It's very rare in therapy for me to say, oh yeah, look at that. I guess I am sad about this. And like, da -da -da -da, you know, and like, oh boy, I feel better now. It's not like that. It's like, it's like, oh my gosh, I, I, I can't, that's, that can't be true. That's not right. I can't, I can't accept that. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh my God. And it hits you. And it's like, you feel just devastated and struck down and you're saying stuff that you're like, don't even want to think about. But then as soon as it's out there, then like, there's just like, there's a sense of relief from that, you know, whatever, whatever that is. And it, um, gives you a chance to move forward because once you admit it, it's there, it's almost like I, I put everything to running for me. It's almost like when you're out on a run and, um, you know, let's say you're, you're many miles into it and you're out of fuel and you're bonking and you put a name to it and you say, you know, you spend a lot of time saying, oh God, I hope I feel better. I hope I don't feel bad. I hope I don't feel bad. And you kind of run from it, run from it. And then all of a sudden you say, oh, I'm bonking here. I don't have enough calories, salt, fluid, whatever. And that's what's going on. And then all of a sudden it's like, somebody says, how are you doing? And you're like, oh, I'm miserable right now, but you know what? It's okay. You know, it's like, I'll be so sad when this is over, <laughs> you know? Sure. So that... Uh, I don't know, self-awareness. What, what, um, what do, what do you think of that? Is that? Oh, what do I think? I think it's, yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, I was going to ask Celeste, mm -hmm. I was going to ask you this question. What, what, why do you run? Is it, is it mental or is it emotional, physical? Um, all of the above. And I've shared before on the podcast, but I suffer from like severe postpartum depression. Like it was really bad. Um, and I got into running and it saved my life. And it also, it did all those things It got me a community. It got me my best friends. It got me healthy. Um, you know, it's, it keeps the depression usually at bay. It, so it, it gave me all of those things. I think it's made me a better role model for my kids. It's made me a better wife. It's given me more patience. It's helped me deal with, you know, the good, the bad, all of it. Um, and I think that part of that is the community. Cause when you're 
sharing miles with people, right? And you're sharing yourself with them. It, it's, it's the therapy. It's, you know, oh, yeah. you're going to find that you're appreciating the good. You're upset about the bad. You're solving problems, whatever. You're able to do all that. It's, you know, and there's times where I'll go out alone and I'll just be in the woods alone all day. And I'll deal with everything that way, recharge. And then there's days where I'll spend just hours and hours with my friends running and that helps, you know? So it's, I think it's so many layers running has brought into my life. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh and like, like in the Bulldogs, you know, there are people who, um, they don't feel good about themselves and, and, or they, they identify themselves in, as an addict or as an alcoholic. Um, but through running now, they identify themselves as a runner. Yes. And, and, and they can also identify goals. And I'm, I'm a runner. I did a 5k. I did a 10k. I, I did a half marathon and, um, mm. it allows their family members to see them differently too, you know? Right. Um, and, and especially in recovery, you, you get people, you know, their, their loved ones have been with them for years. They've, they've, they've lived through the, you know, the wreckage and the broken promises yep. and, and they don't even believe that this person can recover. And now not only does the person recover, they're running, you know, they're, they're right. on top of their game. How fascinating mm. is that? Yeah. And I, for me, like, it's a little bit different, but that loss of identity, right. Where you don't like as a stay at home mom, my only identity was mom. Yeah. Right. I didn't have any other identity. And yeah finding that like that part of my self-esteem where it was like, okay, now I'm a runner. Right. And I, I take so much from that. Whereas like, that's my identity. It's so much of who I am. Yeah. Yeah. I was yeah. going to, I was going to just, uh, just add and, and anyone comment on this, but I have felt that some of the, my moments of greatest clarity and insight have come re related either to running or exercise. Yeah. that it, it's it's, it's the, that. the best moments of my day and and i just yep. see the world better um and i think that's one of the reasons and and for us at the bulldogs it's really important it's not just about running now we need them to be running 10 years from now your mm -hmm. recovery is predicated on it so yep. it, this it, this has to be fun it has to be enjoyable it has to be sustaining Wow. And I find personally, I find joy in running and in like, I love events. I love whether I'm cheering or crewing or pacing or racing. I'm one of those nutcases that's 99% of the time I'm happy. And I'm like cheering and yelling and just making life fun. You know, when I hit my dark spot, then I'm the opposite and I'm literal evil, but <laughs> usually I'm that happy person on course that will get to know every other runner. And, you know, it, so there's, there's that joy too, that that brings me. Wonderful. Wow. Um, so, so Jim, so what, so what sort of people then are you, are you working mostly with or, or in the Bulldogs or is it most people new in recovery and new to running or is it kind of a mix of that or? Yeah, it's, it's a mix of that. So we're only eight years old, but mm -hmm. uh, we have new members. I was at a, at a we have four runs a week um, it, throughout Boston. And uh, I should say we have five runs a week in four different locations. And mm -hmm. um Last night in Quincy, we had five new members, you know, and these are these are people who, but uh, two of them had run and three of them hadn't. So I usually walk with the people who haven't run, kind of get to know them um, as they get into the club, into the organization. We have a program called Full Circle. They set up wellness goals and recovery goals. Not all of our members are, by the way, are in recovery, just, just so mm -hmm. you know. But for those who are, and we give them running goals or, or recovery goals. And then when they meet them, uh, it's usually about a six, maybe eight week process. They, it, it's, a, it's a big celebration, a big event for the club. Um, and then we have a second program called Full Circle Two. And when, they, and when they graduate from that, we ask them, do they want to be leaders in the club? And then hmm. the leaders run our run, organize the runs. We also do outreach to soup kitchens, shelters, recovery centers, places like that. And our leaders do that. Excellent, and we, we pay excellent. them. We also pay them to do it. Yeah. Yeah. That's such a, I think that's such a great thing. I think all the, the 
many of the great programs that I can think of, like um, scouting, um, uh, AA, <laughs> sure. um, all of that is, you know, you start out by learning the tasks yourself and then you get into a, a, an upper level of that. And then to really keep it going, you teach others and you get that satisfaction of, um, of kind of, you know, helping others. And, and I just want to say that um, many of our members are also in AA or mm -hmm. NA. Um, and so this is just like another tool in the recovery toolbox. Mm -hmm. But the person who founded the Bulldogs, Coach Mike Ferullo, um, mm -hmm. became a heroin addict at a very young age. Um, and then he, he, he recovered, but AA at that time, he's 75 now, but at that time, AA was not so welcoming for people in with, with the drug addiction. Sure. They are now, and I'm an mm -hmm. AA guy, but, mm -hmm. but they, they, they weren't then. So running became his go-to. And then he, he became a, a very successful, um, social worker, started his own practice and, um, built the Bulldogs. Interesting. And was that his, he came up with the name? Yeah. As far he as came you know, up is with there the name. a story behind that? Or? I was, I thought you might ask this and I don't oh, know if I, I, I don't know if I really know the story. I, so I'm going to just I'm gonna make one it. up. It's cool. Go ahead. Well, once upon a time. <laughs> <laughs> so I do know that they had, he had a bulldog. I do know he had a bulldog. Um, okay. And I think in terms of legend and lore, I think bulldogs used to be able to take down bulls. Mm. And, um, there's a ferocity to them. And they, I mean, hey, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, you know, but a bulldog might not be the most attractive dog out there. <laughs> but, but dear God, they got heart, you know, and um, they got tenacity. Yeah. And yeah. so it's uh, excellent. Yeah, excellent. Grit. If you have grit. Yeah. They, and they, grit. Thank you, Fred. Yes. They really do. <laughs> and if you, yeah. um, I think it was white in the book, White Fang. Um, uh, the, the wolf actually had a, um, came across and, and I, I think there was a bulldog that kind of ended up, you know, he, he was involved. I think the animal was involved in, uh, in, in fighting and then eventually got face to face with a bulldog. And, and the, that was like, he was like, oh, this isn't going to be a challenge at all. This is like a joke. And he went and he attacked the bulldog and just, was just like jabbing, you know, in dog parlance, but, you know, and then finally the dog got him and he's like, what? He's got, he's got me, but that it's not going to hurt me. But then he just would not let go <laughs> and would just slowly just like, you know, just hung on and fought his way through. And, um, you know, it wasn't very good for White Fang. <laughs> now, the other reason, you know, the other interesting part about the name, the Boston Bulldogs Running Club, is is we have sweatshirts and jackets and stuff like that to say the Boston Bulldogs. But only someone who knows the club knows what that's about. Mm. And that's a kind of cool thing. You know, it's sure. kind of like you're either you either know or you're not, you know, people yeah. like you're in a running club. What the heck's that about? You know, but it's actually much more involved. We also, by the way, we also have 17 of our members are running the Boston Marathon this year. Wow. Nice. Yeah, yeah, they're charity members to the Boston Boston Athletic Association gave us 15 bibs and we picked up two others. Mm -hmm. And um wow. And it, it's a big deal for us. We're very appreciative of the BAA. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's that's great. It is um the, it is the best marathon in the world, you ah. know. It's um you know, ah. I according to me no it is it is oh, like yeah. any any like you know as a runner gosh when you run that it there's in my mind there just couldn't be anything more um spectacular if, as far as that sort of experience where you have just people who have been there you know it's the same people there it's their tradition of cheering and setting up and the whole thing and and you you train you begin i mean i used to train um I'd begin in January, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. running in back of snow plows. And, um, and then a April shows up and it can be hot and it can be cold. Um, the hardest part of the race is, is, you know, mile 16, 17, 18. And when the, when heartbreak Hill kicks in the, the Hills and, yes. um, you know, it, it, there's so much to it. And I, I used to say mm -hmm. it's a 20, it's a six mile race. Okay, 
It's mm. a six. It, it, but the, the the starting line is twenty miles long. Yeah. You know, <laughs> oh, that once, is so well put. It, it, right, you just yep. get there. Mile twenty begins the race. And and yes. the other thing is, and this is so important, is that you don't. You start. I used to start in tiny increments. And I'd build and build and build, you know, a, a city block, two blocks, a half mile, a mile increments. And that's how you tackle a marathon. You break it into pieces, mm -hmm. you, you know, and then, you know, you don't go at it straight. And, and if you approach most of the big objects in your life, your career, your marriage, that's how it's done. Mm. Right? It's, yeah. it, it, there's a whole life lesson here. Yeah, no, no doubt about it. And um, yeah, Boston is is so much like that, you know. And it's each part is is so different, you know. You don't just have like random mile markers to look forward to, you know. You have every everything, you know. And it's kind of funny because by the I I found that by the time I reached the top of heartbreak, if if I don't have it, it's like it's game's over. But if, if I can get there, you know, I, in my best races have been getting to the top of heartbreak, feeling okay, not feeling great, but feeling yep. okay. And then just releasing the hounds of hell and just running as hard as I could down the backside of that and through the rest of the course. And, um, you know, all my PR, all, most of my PRs were at Boston, just running negative splits there. And how, how many how many marathons are did you did you how many Boston I I, I did uh, eight there. Holy cow! And I think Fred's done nine. No, right, no, Fred? no, just three, just three. Three. Oh, two thousand two, two thousand three, and two thousand seven. Seven. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We had Des Linden on, and um, at that point, um, I think I think three of us were there, and all three of us had done Boston in addition to Des. So. It was uh, kind of yep. uh, interesting. In 2007, we were all there. That was her first year, my first year. So we had some uh, had some fun. But Boston, the whole community is just is just wonderful. They're like the fans are even professionals, you know. Oh um, yeah, I learned I, that if you put your name on the front of your T-shirt, yes, they'll, yes, they'll call you by name. They call yeah. you by name. They'll treat yeah. you by name. Yeah, I, yeah. I just steal other people's names, Fred. <laughs> like I run behind somebody. <laughs> It's would, like just runners mental games. I run behind people and they're like saying, go Joe, come on, Joe. And I just tell myself, my name is Joe. All right. <laughs> and, and, I remember going by BC when you come up at the, up the top of heartbreak and you're going to come down and, yes. and people were like, Fred, 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 Fred. <laughs> Cause I had Fred on the top of my t-shirt. I was like, yeah. And then I got down like to Cleveland circle yes. and some dude was like, wow, that's really clever putting your name on your t-shirt. And I said, yeah, somebody told me I should do that. And he said, yeah. I can't put my name on my t-shirt. And I said, why not? And he said, my name's Forrest. Oh, oh wow. God. <laughs> run, Forrest. Run, run Forrest, run. run. Forrest. Uh, sorry, go. I ruined your no, boss. I was like, all right, I'm sorry, Forrest. Forrest. <laughs> you cannot put your name on your t-shirt. Yeah, oh, right. That's a yeah, very good Forrest Gump impersonation, by the way. That was very yeah. good. Thank yeah. you. Yes. Thank you, Jenna. Yeah. <laughs> Jenna. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, boy. Moving on. Yeah. So um, so how many members are in the club right now? Or if, if it's defined yeah, like we have, that? We have 400, 400 members. Wow. And, wow. Uh, and nice. we're growing. Excellent. Yeah. I tell you, I feel like it grows every day. It oh. is extraordinary and there's a lot of interest not just outside not just within our zip codes it's like outside interest you know um i was i was speaking in worcester two weeks ago at an aa meeting and and i i was talking about the bulldogs and afterwards it was like how do i join you oh, know yeah. I, and because the idea that there would be a community out there that would help you in your recovery that would also just you know a, a great social outlet and a physical outlet um it's it's a it's a it's an innovative idea. Mm. It's a hot idea. Well, you, you think about people in recovery, at least I, I can think about myself in recovery. Okay. So when I first got into recovery, I was um, physically, spiritually, and mentally bankrupt. Right. So sure. uh, like most people are when they get there. Right. I mean, otherwise most people don't end up there until you reach 
that point. But um, the physical, so I, I took care of the spiritual first. That was the thing I had to take care of first. Um, and then after that, um, I went to school <laughs> and I got, you know, went and got a degree. And then the day that I wrote my last paper, um, I went for a two mile run. Um, to get my physical stuff back. And that was really, oh, there's Fred's cat <laughs> on cue. <laughs> <laughs> um, <here>. um, <laughs> so <laughs> it's just so distracting. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, oh, God. God. There it is. <laughs> oh, that's a good kitty. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, and and then you know, but I I could see that being especially being in early recovery, and all of a sudden, like sometimes just the level of whatever it is at a given moment, the rage or the just uh, the 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 inner unrest is is. I mean, I I remember driving home once from a meeting, and like I had a, a problem with my girlfriend. I was wearing cowboy boots at the time <laughs> and I, I was just going to drive my car into somebody or into a car or into a tree or just completely out of my mind. And I didn't know what to do. So I pulled into a parking lot and it happened to be a park that had a track and I got out and I ran laps wow. in cowboy boots Wow! just to like, not yeah, just to not drive my car into a tree or into another car. Oh, oh okay. So I, you're onto something that really gets me. Um, in this role, I'm in prisons and recovery centers with some regularity. Mm -hmm. And I'm amazed at the ones I've been to have been great, but I'm amazed at how many programs have no physical outlet. Uh, in terms of running or or mm -hmm. weight access to a weight room or, or something like that, it, it's like if there was ever a place that needed it, a prison needs it, jails need it, and um, recovery centers need it. Mm. And and you know you may not be able to afford a gym, but running sneakers and 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 a granola bar afterward is not a lot to ask, mm. you know. And um, it just seems to me like this is it's key. I, I think. I, and that we're also working with uh, people at Northeastern and people at Harvard to try and develop um, evidence-based research to kind of ground what we do and say, no, it, it's grounded in research. You know, running, there's a study that came out, I think in October, it was published, it was written up in Forbes that that running is as effective or, or, or as effective as medication for depression. Hmm. Hmm. And it's like- I found it. Really? You know, it's like, mm -hmm. we're not- we're not suggesting running because we think everyone needs a hobby. If we if we felt that way, we'd be building birdhouses. You know, it's running because it works. Yes. Yeah. It works. Yeah. And, and, and we should be doing it in prisons. We should do be doing it in recovery, and we should be teaching people in recovery centers what an exercise exercise program work looks like. Yeah, this and is it part has of your life. It it is, and and the 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 good part about it too is that it has its own governor built into it. Um, in that, like, you're going to only run as, as fast as you can. Right. I mean, or as, you know, you run and then you run until you're done running, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and you get that feedback and, um, it, it does, it changes you physically and, um, and certainly, you know, chemically it changes, it makes a, a, a hard and fast, um, you know, change in your chemistry. You know, yeah. we've all had that end of the day, you know, done with our work, completely stressed out, go for a run, come back and everything is, everything is wonderful. So, so I was, I was going to ask people here, if, do you remember what it was like when you weren't a runner? And, and I used to have this experience, you know, with reg frequently I'd be as a, as a coach, I'd ask, I'd have to try and get kids to do cross country track and, mm. you know, and, and you'd see a kid and like they're thin and, and they, they've got the body type. And it's like, have you ever thought about running? Oh, no, I don't run. And I, I would say, well, it's a lot like walking, but it's just a little faster, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And they would be like, oh, really? You know? And and if you think about running while you're running, you'll never run another step because it sucks. I mean, like 
you don't know what to do with your breathing. You don't know what <laughs> you're right. I mean, it's like, mm. oh my, it's painful. And it's like running is learning what to do, how not to think about running. Mm. It becomes, a, and then, then for me, it became a really mental, emotional, even spiritual experience. Yeah, that's, that's, um, that's, that's really cool. We, we've had, we've talked about that where um, the idea that only one thing can hurt at a time, <laughs> you know, you can't concentrate on multiple pain. So sometimes having, wow. and, and I, I don't know exactly how true that is because lots of times, lots of things can hurt, but you can't, it's hard to multitask on different parts, different painful things. And um you know, but the, the focus that running demands and specifically, I think trail running, um, is, um, is profound, you know, because if you don't, you know, road running, you can get into a, a trance and, a rip, and yeah. get going. Um, but I think like I I've talked to vets who, um, the, the you know the the first time they heard true silence you know there's a film uh, that a vet put together about that is running at night you know because you go if you go trail running at night then that's like graduate level um trail running because gotcha. you can't look away for a second or you're going to run into a tree you're going to run into a rock and so that becomes your focus and it's just it it kind of like aligns your um, your mental state. I love that. I, I'm wondering. Um, I had a conversation with a, a guy in the Bulldogs. It, I, do you know the name Pat Karen? Oh, He's, oh uh, sure, yes, I know. Pat, yeah. Patrick uh, was the one who. Um, connected us brought, yes he did yes yeah and he's extraordinary and he's yes. he's brought uh the trail run uh to the to the bulldogs so we do trail run every week mm -hmm. and um but I, I think there's a there's an ecological thing going on here you know that running like think of what i was saying before about running connecting us to that inner inner in, e equilibrium that inner balance mm -hmm. um but I, when you put it in nature you know you we're connecting to our the earth to the universe yes. there's something deeper going on there mm. so yeah i mean i'm sure that you've heard about studies where even even the difference between looking at pictures of cityscapes versus looking at pictures of trees wow. um you know produces changes in the body so yeah. um yeah when you're out running and uh you know in, in the woods on the trails especially that will um that will that will change you you can't help yeah. it you know yeah um and it is a uh that's that's a great that's a that's great so how do you um have you ever part do you guys ever partner with other organizations or other insti like institutions like halfway houses or you know that yeah, sort we, of thing we do so we we do actually so we run several programs called the junior bulldogs and so mm -hmm. we we're introducing kids at risk kids to wellness, to running, um, we're going to work with. Um, we work with the Italian Home uh, in in Roslindale. Um, mm -hmm. We're going to we're going to do a program with Crystal Ray School in, in Boston, and um, yeah. But we're also yeah. So we we do a program at at Charles River Hospital, for instance, and we 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 meet the people who are there in recovery and introduce them to this idea of wellness and, and running because they're not going to be there forever. And, and some of them are in our area. So we're like, you know, mm. put a face, put a face and a name together. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll see you at chess at, at chess and hell on, um, on Saturday morning at nine, you know, and, uh, and it's been working mm. and it's important. Yeah. Because I mean, for a lot of people, they don't have exposure to any of these experiences, right? Yeah. And and for many of them, if they don't put a name to a face, they're not going to come. It's it's mm. it's Herculean to meet a group of people who you don't know, and yet let alone try right. to be vulnerable with these people. And so there is this thing with the bulldogs about community, like it's an accepting community. And mm -hmm. I would say even like there has to be this idea of unconditional acceptance. Mm -hmm. And many many people in recovery have never really experienced that. You know, they, their family situations were such 
they never really felt, and that may explain why you know they needed drugs or alcohol or whatever but yeah it's it's got to be a, like an unconditional acceptance and i'm also st what amazes me it happened last night is how open this group is about issues that in other environments you would never talk about you know mm. like 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 how's your mental health today <laughs> It's like what? You know, be careful when you ask that question. And but but yeah, no, you, it, it's normal. It, maybe we should all normalize that kind of behavior. You know, mm. it's like yeah, it, you know, it's what's the deal? You know, that's that's great. Yeah, because especially with the young people, uh, um, it's important to do that because you never know what seeds you're planting there. Um, if you can get somebody to uh, go out and run you know, at a young age, I just, I, I tell the story all the time that um, when I was in, um, when I was in sixth grade, I had one year of cross country, one season of cross country. And I was pretty much, I, I, if I use the word middle of the pack, that's like being really generous, like yeah. back of the pack kind of runner. And um and, and that was it. I went one year doing that. And then I went on to other things like soccer and other things like that. And then didn't play sports at all. But when I was 38 years old and I wrote my last paper and wanted to go for a run, I knew that I could run because I was a runner because Mr. Bree taught me how to run. He told me, yep, yeah, you just swing your arms like this and you kind of run in a straight line. That's better than a wide stance and it's more efficient and you breathe and it, you suffer a little bit, but it's okay. You don't die. And, you know, just, just that knowing that I could do that. I was a runner because he had taught me that. So that is so, so interesting to me. I, I have, I think, I think this junior bulldogs program, I think what we're doing is we're helping kids um, develop recovery capital that they'll either use now or they will use in the future. And and that's things like learning how to speak to another person about things that are going on in your life. That's recovery capital. Mm -hmm. Or learning how to run, Art. Learning how mm -hmm. to run or how, what mindfulness looks like or what nutrition or wellness looks like. I've got, I've got here's a couple statistics, all right? There was a, there was a survey done of 221 U.S. public high school counselors, all right? These are mm -hmm. guidance counselors. And 51% identified social media addiction as a major concern in their school, 51%, followed by marijuana at 40%, and non-suicidal self-injury, that's cutting, at 37%. Wow. Like, these are young kids, and yeah. this is what we're doing. And, and so it's like, Right. And then alcohol is 20 percent, you know, then I don't know where I don't think I don't even know if vaping is on the list. But these are just amazing statistics. Yeah. And it's like get them when they're young, help them. It's it's recovery capital. Every time you go to a run, every time you go to the gym, you're putting money in your in your recovery capital bank. Mm. And you'll draw on that later on when if you hit a divorce, if you lose a job. If if you if you become an addict, you'll recover. You you will draw on that. It will keep you strong. It mm. helps you walk the beam. Gotcha, gotcha. So, um, is what is the method or the structure, um, if there is one, um, for the bulldogs as far as recovery is concerned? Like you know, AA has their twelve steps, and are there uh, principles of the program, or is this more of a, um, you know, what what does that look like? Sure. So, so we have three principles that look a lot like the twelve, this the twelve steps divided by three, mm -hmm. and 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 the first part is a lot about your ability to accept that this is your recovery is in your own hands. Mm -hmm. That's a really important step. You know, it's like, and and I I tell you, and we again, you know, we we speak at at different recovery centers. There is this idea like, fix me. You know, no, 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 it doesn't work that way. When yeah. you're ready, this will work for you. You might not be ready yet, but when you're ready, mm -hmm. this will work. When you want to get serious with this, this will work. The other thing is you have to be, it, it, our second principle is is um, is being self, um, 
uh, it's exposing your vulnerabilities, understanding um, it's self-transparency, being being clear with others about what you're doing, being clear with yourself. Uh, okay, so much sure. of us lie to ourselves all the time, you know, yes. and, oh, and, yeah. the third, and our third principle is you have to give back. Yes. And when you give back, you gain. Mm -hmm. If you if you give back and it, it breaks you out of yourself, it breaks, it brings you into the sphere of, of community. Yeah. And then yeah. and then you're stronger. And if you kind of step back and look at the, the 12 steps oh, that Bill Wilson yeah. put together, that's absolutely it. hands down. Four, four, four. Yeah. Yep. You got you like your first step of, you know, admitting that you, you're powerless and that you, yeah. you know, your life's unmanageable and you're taking, you know, and, and taking responsibility. You got to do this. You got to yeah. do this. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's really great. That's, that's good. That makes me happy to hear that. Cause I've have heard there are some, and I'm not going to name names, but I've heard some other, I've heard, I've listened to some podcasts out there lately that have had, um, I mean, I guess people are doing whatever is working for them, but just like, I'm almost like people are like giving it away the day they get it, <laughs> which, yeah. which is like, it's like in one hand, it's good. And in the other hand, it's like, it's kind of scary. Yeah. You know, um, we are, we're going to start a new program uh, probably later this month. It'll be uh, a virtual offering. It's going to be called Meditation and More. Mm -hmm. And um, the founder of the, of the Bulldogs, Mike Furillo, is going to be he, he'll be leading it. Um, and it's you know, it's not like every it's not like everyone in the Bulldogs is into meditation, mm -hmm. but I but many are. And and this could be another really important recovery tool. Um, and it's not going to be just a Bulldog thing. It's going to be open to everybody. So it'll be accessible through our website and mm -hmm. people can can, you know, go to www, you know, Boston Bulldogs running dot dot org and and you can find out more gotcha gotcha so there's no specific um you you don't have to be an alcoholic to join the bulldogs is that correct right you don't have to be an alcoholic or a drug addict but mm -hmm. we have but but all we really say is you know or adversely affected by drug and alcohol addiction that's like mm -hmm. everybody mm -hmm. so we have family members who you know may have lost a loved one to addiction or we have uh, a mom who's struggling with her son who's an addict um mm -hmm. and it is a wonderful cross fertilization of of experience i mean it's really beneficial for everybody we kind of have this thing we we don't really put people on the spot and ask them about you know are you in recovery or not mm. and i and we're very distrustful of this idea that kind of um uh you know like you're in the club or you're not in the club I, no 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 you know please don't you know you're 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 in recovery or not, we don't want to isolate. We don't want to create a, a group within our group at all. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's really important. The other is, is um, there's a kind of distrust for recovery stories. Um, you know, I was lost and now I'm found. Everything, everything went to shit and now it's great, you know? Oh, yeah, Be yeah. Because, because that's not real. Recovery is messy stuff. Yes. And, and, um, and so you had asked before what kind of, you know, yes, we have people who are new, you know, who are, are new to recovery, but it's long term. We want to make this long term, too. So uh, we're on eight years. We have people who've been with us for eight years hmm. and this is working for them. We want them for eight more, you know? Yeah, yeah. I think that's great. I, I, I think that's great. And I, I love that approach, too, because sometimes that does get um, uh, certainly some meetings can get into that habit where it's like everybody who speaks kind of has like this story that kind of wraps it all up and like what yeah. happened you know you know what it was like and what you know what what it's like now and and that it's like yep i'm i'm here and i used to be there and i still have more to go but not really like living in that moment too much and yeah it, like i sometimes feel like as somebody who has like a, a lot of years without a drink I'm like, I, I don't go to meetings anymore um, simply because I almost feel like if I go there, I have to sound like a guy who's 40 years. <laughs> and, yeah. and it's just like, I don't know, like some, and I don't know, I, I read, um, not to, oh, I, I, I would be going I, off I on I think it's here. humility. I think what you're talking about is real humility. And I, I, I think that's a very important dimension for recovery. 
Mm. And and you, you haven't climbed a mountain because you you know you're hours away from relapse. By the way, yeah, you yeah, know, we all are. Mm-hmm. And so it's not like I climbed a mountain and like, you know, you know, that's what I No, you're you're fully aware of how what a struggle it was. Mm-hmm. And it's it's not a simple little car. We don't. We we make our experience almost like a cartoon, mm. you know, like like a caricature of what it was. Yes. And and I'm 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 I like you. I mean, I'm acutely aware yeah, of yeah. how painful it was and yeah. and how how hard it is sometimes to walk the bean. Yeah. Sobriety is not an American film. It's called, it's more like a, a, a neo-realist film where oh. it's just like a slice of life where like, it's just going to end and the guy's going to sort of ride away on his bicycle, but not really have anything resolved. <laughs> yeah. It, Disney did not write the recovery film. Yeah. 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 It doesn't, that's, it doesn't end truth. with a half. It will, it can, by the way, yeah, I mean, by the way, it can, you know, and it, 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 it it, 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 it's just that it's um, it's complicated. We are complicated people. Yeah, it it is especially so amazing in the especially in the beginning. You know, is the the part that always blew my mind in uh, you know, in people in recovery. You know, where they they really they come in shaking and just like out really completely out of it. Like you're afraid of these people, and then like you know couple couple weeks couple months depending on where they started after a while you know yeah now they're like a real person that you can connect with and talk to and you're yes. no longer like afraid that they're going to kill you <laughs> right you know? they grow yes. they grow yeah, yeah. yeah and it's marvelous and it's wonderful and mm. and um it, and they grow and and the other thing is and we keep growing mm-hmm. you know it's not like i conquered this i'm i'm 5 years sober i've conquered this no, you're yeah. still growing. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, you better. I mean, you better because you never arrive. You know, you never arrive. Like, because you're going to be, uh, is you know, you're going to be looking for that next sustenance uh, hunt. You know, yeah. and yeah, because otherwise it just, you know, I, I think, I don't know. I find myself that I, I just know. Like, I've had some really great things happen in my life, and like, you know, every I thought like the first time. I ran a marathon, like when I crossed New York marathon finish line, that that was going to be it. I was going to have that medal in my hand. And from that point forward, no one could ever say anything to me or nothing would ever bother me again. And I was a hundred, I was convinced of that. If I could overcome that distance, that amazing, incredible, impossible distance, that it would be like, it would be like life would be a walk in the park. And and it was it was true to a certain extent, you know, but it like that kind of like wore on a little bit. And, you know, and then I thought that with every other distance that I've done, you know, it, you know, and and thought, you know, for a long time thinking that like a distance is going to is going to get me there. But it's really not about that. You know, it's it's. Um, for me, it's like, it just, and now it starts sounding really corny, but like, yeah, the joy is in the journey. The joy is in the run that you did. You know, my most important run was, was, uh, the hike that I did today. It wasn't even a run. (laughs) So, you know, the walk I went with, with my wife. So, um, Fred, what's your, what are your thoughts on this? You've been, I know you were, your cat was attacking you there for a minute. So. We lost Fred for a while there. She wasn't attacking. She was just sitting right in front of the camera for about 20 minutes, but she left. So it's okay. I was yeah. listening to the whole thing. I, you know, um, I, I, everything you said makes perfect sense to me. I, I really think that um, you clearly cannot say I've gotten here to any place in your life and mm. like in, unless you're dead you know yeah. <laughs> right it's then all it's, it's all a work in progress yeah. always right mm-hmm. and you're yeah. all, like like jim said you're like you're just hours away from a relapse or a problem or like turning in the wrong like going up to the stop sign and turning in the wrong direction you never know but mm. uh, but you have to so you have to be in the present and vigilant all the time mm. And yeah. it's a good life. It's a really good life, but you have to kind of keep making it good. It doesn't just happen yeah. for you. Mm. Yeah, that's I true. 
uh, it's something I've been really think a lot about is ego and and ego run amok it, it it may not be for everybody but in my world it, it did it ran my it ran away with me and um and in aa they, there's a there's a guy in my home group who uses the expression walking the beam and it, it reminds me like focus on the beam and hmm. and i feel i've always felt there's some part of me that i i was not born with it, i i i don't have a re, a self regulator and so I don't know how to stay on the beam. I, you know, I like something. I, and I go for it, hundred percent. I need to stay focused. But, but there is something about running, about grounding yourself in what you're doing at the moment that takes me away from my ego. Mm. That makes me, I think, that that takes me in, and I think makes me, I think, more compassionate. And I think if, if I can grow in compassion, then then I think I will be okay. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Huh. But yeah, it, ego definitely takes, um, you know, shows itself, um, you know, certainly in my, and, and I'm always struggling with that. I always look at that and I'm like, why is it that I run better when other people are around? <laughs> Like, I don't want to be that guy. I want to be the kind of person that can show up at the track at five o'clock in the morning and work and mm. do my repeats and nail all my workouts and have perfect form and do all that, even when no one's looking. And I can do that to a certain extent, but if somebody shows up, I just, and I just do better. I just do better. And I don't know what it is. Even if like, I would have somebody come to the track and start kicking a soccer ball around. And they don't care that I'm there. They probably don't even know I'm there, except to think, boy, I wonder if they're watching me play soccer, you know? Um, but for whatever reason, yeah, if somebody's, um, somebody's watching me, I, I tend to do, um, you know, I tend to do better and it, and it bugs me, but that's kind of how it is, you know? So. Um, One of my friends actually said the other day, which really hit me is that, um, you're not Harry Potter in anybody else's story, right? <laughs> like you're Harry Potter in your story, but not in anyone else's. Mm. And it's kind of a reminder that, you know, all of us have that story, right? All yeah. of us are in a story about me, right? Like my story is about me, but no one else's story is about me. And it, if you yeah. can remember that, it, it kind of gives you, like you were saying, Jim, that compassion for others and that, you know, letting ourselves look around, like situational awareness, I guess, right? That other people yeah. are going through something. Mm, it's yeah, just, I, you know, like so you much... said, that soccer guy doesn't know just you. You're not Harry Potter to him, right? Mm -hmm. it, I, I, a, friend just... of, a friend of mine used to say, Remember that everyone is going through the most difficult time of their life. Hmm, and yeah. it was like, no way. Everyone is going through the most difficult time of your life right now. And and um, I, 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 I think it's something I've been thinking a lot about is the role of suffering in our lives. I think I think we I think we transform through suffering and and um, and maybe through discomfort. And and I think that running helps us helps me do that. Working out helps me realize that you know it. I don't know. I'm not sure if the analogy is really clear, but do, do you think it changes right. your, uh, for lack of a better word, your homeostasis for your um, level of comfort? Yes. You know, like yeah. all we need to do if you want to feel uncomfortable, like you know, like what do we all think? Like, oh, wouldn't it be good to just like sit on the couch all day and watch TV all day. And then you do that. And okay. Like, okay. You do that like four days in a row. Right. Okay. <laughs> and then it's like, well, you do that. And then all of a sudden it's just, it's not that much fun. But if you like go for a run and then you, you, you know, you come and sit on the couch, then that couch is like the best thing in the world. So, so just so you know, I mean, there are other benefits of running too, of course, mm. right? You know, like you lose weight, you have confidence, uh, you you know, 
you know, if, if there's a fire, you're the first one there, you know, because you can run. There are a lot of things. When I was, I stopped marathoning because mm -hmm. I was eating a half gallon of ice cream a day just to keep weight on. <laughs> and, I, I, and I said, I said, when, when my, ta my, when my, metal my metabolism changes, when I'm 50, I'm going to start mm -hmm. marathoning again. Hmm. And uh, unfortunately, that's when I did the um, the hip. And uh, so that was not in the cards for me. But, you know, it was like, oh, right. There are other, I was talking earlier about the emotional and 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 mental benefits. Or, and, and there are, and they're significant, but they're incredible physical benefits too. And and the, the guy who, who, who uh, Coach Ferrillo, who started the Bulldogs, you know, he's saying, a lot of his friends from AA and recovery and all that, they didn't take care of themselves. Mm. And and they die before their years. Yeah. And and I I'm 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 I have some great friends in my my home group in Worcester. I've been to three funerals in a year. It's like, mm. you know, it's not just about clutching a cup of coffee, sitting in circle and 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 sharing or hearing somebody else share again, you know, mm. run. Do something healthier. Get mm -hmm. off the couch. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there is a there is a boost that you get from going to a meeting too. I, I would compare it to the same, you know, you get that same sort of feeling to it. Like you feel like you did something good for yourself on yeah. a given day. And I you've do gotten too. I do. Of you course. Know, like you you run in the morning and then for the rest of the day, there's this little part of me that says, Yeah, yep. I I, I just feel like complete. And the same thing with the yeah. meeting, you know, you go to a meeting, it's like, yep, I kind of like, I, I put something in my account today. But there is this long term thing about health, like you can mm. add years to your life. Yes, you, you can add decades to your life, you know, just mm -hmm. stop smoking, put down the alcohol, it, lose weight. And listen to and listen to Culture Trail Running Podcast. Exactly. Yes. Right. <laughs> and you can yep. add life to your years too. And right? so true, you right? Better, right. You that is better. so true, right? It's not just about quantity; it's quality. Yeah, yes. of course. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. By the way, uh, on, when you're talking about the beam, it reminded me. Let me. Here's my Stephen King uh, plug. Stephen King, who was an AA -er, or is an AA -er. I didn't know that. In in the uh, in the Dark Tower series, there's they're they're headed toward a, a destination and the clouds line up and he keeps talking about there's a path there's a path that you have to you can mm -hmm. see the path and you follow the path and that's what it just reminded me of when you're talking mm -hmm. about staying on the beam on the train yes <laughs> well on the train at some points you know blame the train but but yes. uh, there you know <laughs> The seven book series. So yes, a the lot gunslinger. of clouds are lining the, up and you're just you're wow. following the path. Yeah. Interesting. So I just can... so you know, Stephen King was a high school teacher in Maine. Mm -hmm. I don't think it was very mm -hmm. successful. His class was out of control. And <laughs> and he got a phone call from the office. He had to leave the classroom, went to the office, got on the phone, and they said, Someone on the other end said, We want to buy Carrie for a million dollars. And then we want to buy and we want to buy the movie rights for like three or four million. He hung up the phone, walks back to the classroom, gets his bag and just walks out. Doesn't say a word. <laughs> oh, my gosh. He apparently had a nail like in his attic with rejections on like that. He would just stick the rejection papers on and it was full. Oh, that's fabulous. Before do, he was finally accepted. Mm. Do, do you know, do you, have you read the back, the Bachman books? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Written by him under another name. They mm -hmm. were, they were all in his steamer trunk. And then he, he got so popular. His, his, his handlers were like, Oh no, don't release it. You know, you, you, you've saturated the market. So he came under a separate name, the Bachman books. Lawnmower mm. man was one of them. Yes. And um, mm -hmm. they, they became very successful. And um, and then someone figured it out. And so yes. he had a, his he had the obituary of Richard Bachman posted, I think, in the Bangor Times. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> killed, yeah. killed. He was a dairy farmer, you know, killed in some crazy accident. <laughs> uh, dairy spelled D-E-R-R-Y. Or there you go. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. I love. uh Love my uh, Stephen King. So I do um, too. Gosh.
Wow. So, um, yeah. what else is there about um, like? Oh, so let's let's talk about this. So, is there um, uh, is there fundraising um, oh, yeah. available? Like, yeah. if you know, because listening to this, it is a uh, it sounds like a great organization and things like that. I know you mentioned that people are doing um, charity races. So yeah, um, exactly. Wh- what it, sort? It, maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Sure. Well, you know, it's a, it's a very small organization. I mean, it's, we have enormous reach I, by some calculations. We're reaching about 10,000 people, hmm. uh, but we're, That's we're phenomenal. small hand to hand to mouth organization. Um, we would well, we welcome donations. We would love corporate sponsors. Uh, we run a, a, a run for recovery and tribute every year. This year, it's going to be at at Franklin Park. It's always at Franklin Park, but this year it's on May 19th, Sunday, May 19th. We'll have hundreds of runners. Um, and then we'll do a, a, like a ceremony for the families of of people who have lost people to addiction. Um, and then our, our other big run uh, fundraiser is our marathon team. Um, mm-hmm. And um, so it's all really important, but Right now, we're also looking at grants. We're trying to chase some of the opioid money that's coming towards Massachusetts. So we're uh, we're looking at vi- in, in various towns that where zip codes we're working in to try and apply for some of that funding, mm-hmm. that some of grant that mm-hmm. grant money. So, so what's what sort of expenses would the group have then? Um, like as far as um, uh, you know, like what sort of things would, would that money be going towards? So like we have, we have a full-time program coordinator. We have mm-hmm. a, you know, we have a, um, all of our leaders are paid. So like mm-hmm. our leaders, when we run our races and things like that, we, we, you know, that's, that's a cost. Uh, when we run our runs, the weekly runs, there's a, there's a cost to that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we, we've got two offices, we have light bill, we've got taxes to do. We need an accountant. Sure. Um, it's all that kind of stuff. And it's like, mm-hmm. that's the machine. We, we, we're out, uh, we're sending groups to recovery centers and places like that. We're also giving out, um, Narcan drug testing trips, strips, um, food, uh, to the homeless at soup kitchens, mm-hmm. shelters, things like that. So we're mm-hmm. kind of, dear goodness, we're doing a lot. You know, we're yeah, doing sounds a lot. Like- and, and yeah. it's, um, you know, we spend it like it's our own money. You know, it's mm-hmm. it, we're very frugal, and and you have to be, and mm-hmm. um, and and that's the other thing. It's amazing. It's like mm-hmm. for for really short money, you get a it goes far. But this gotcha. organization the organization does is unbelievable, and it's growing every day. By the way, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's a reason um, for that, Jim. It's growing because it's yeah. doing good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Yeah, it is. Um, it is. It is. Thank you. Thank you for. Um, so, um, so I guess we're, we will definitely have a link uh, to you guys in our show notes um, and, you know, encourage people to, uh, you know, if you have a couple extra bucks, some um, send them, Please. send them your way. You know, I think it, um, you know, if, if what we said tonight, um, if it, uh, you know, if it resonated with you, if it didn't, um, then you should seek professional help yourself, or maybe it's a little bit too close to home and you should maybe look at that. Right. <laughs> well, just, yeah. just, on, just on that, you know, if you want, you know, there's so many runners out there mm-hmm. and be an ally of people in recovery, join the Boston Bulldogs. It, and we, our membership is like 50 bucks uh, a year. Mm-hmm. Join the Boston Bulldogs mm. and encourage your friends to join it. And, and, you know, come out and join our, be part of our, our run for recovery. Um, you know, wear, wear a bulldog shirt with pride and, and, mm-hmm. and set, set the message up because part of this is also removing the stigma. You know, a lot of people live with a lot of stigma about recovery and addiction. It's like, oh, no, 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 we're with you. We're with you. And it means, and it means a great deal. So we're, our website is bostonbulldogsrunning.org. Thank you. Okay, that's awesome. Um, there's also Glastonbury Greyhounds, so <laughs> excellent. <laughs> I no, I shouldn't see Fred. There I go again. Right there, like, you go. We had something good going here. Objection. This, this is yeah, why we can't have this. nice guests. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> just because of this. <laughs> um, I, I was so, going to say Cheshire Cats, but that's I think that that's a child's uh, gymnastics organization. Yeah. So you don't have to donate to that. Okay. Cheshire Cats. 
Yeah. Uh, no, Glastonbury Greyhounds, we were actually, we started, I was involved with starting a running club in Glastonbury, the uh, River Runners. And um, one of the things that I put out there was Glastonbury Greyhounds. And they're like, we're not going to call ourselves dogs. And I was like, come on. Dogs are better than people. Uh, and right. then huskies. Come on, everyone. We're exactly. better. Okay. We well, love dogs. In, instead, the River Dogs runners. are better than people. And yeah. Celeste has her own running group. She calls the idiots. Come on, you know? Yes, my running group is the idiots. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. That's because they run with me in the woods. So they're idiots. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Um, all right. So oh, I wanted, I did want to ask you, um, given the importance of running and, and, um, and mental health and stuff, how did you deal with that when you were faced with um, injury yourself? How did you, um, maybe you could talk a little bit about I became what... an addict. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm sorry. That's right. When. Yeah. yeah. So, so, you know, like I couldn't, I couldn't run. I couldn't work out. I, I did actually, I was, I was going to the gym until, until surgery, mm. but, um, you know, I was, I was just trying really hard with alcohol and, and pills to, to manage pain that is excruciating pain, by the way. And if, and for anybody listening, you know, if, 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 if hip surgery is knocking at your door, it's phenomenal surgery. It's mm. life changing. For, hmm. Just do it and don't, don't procrastinate that. That would be my suggestion. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Boy, I was, I'm ho I, I need to hear that from somebody who had sh uh, shoulder replacement. So, well, well at, so in, in kind of in another, another, another vein is um, I met a woman and asked, and I, I was saying before, we got to be really careful about when we ask people why they're in it, but she was sharing. And I was like, so, so how, what got you on this path of, of, of being an, an addict? And she said, I had a baby. Hmm. She had mm -hmm. a cesarean section. Mm -hmm. They prescribed opioids. Oh yeah. They send you home with oh. opioids. She became addicted. Uh, I met, um, my my brother is involved in in um uh, he's a social worker and uh, he he was overseeing a, a prison in in Massachusetts. He met somebody who was in prison who was a police officer um, in prison for armed robbery. Um, that police officer was shot in the line of duty. Given opioids, he became an addict. He was holding up CVS pharmacies. So we mm. could get drugs. I mean, it's just like, oh my gosh, that's wow. that's what we're dealing with, mm. you know? Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. It's uh, yeah. that's you know, and if it, if yeah, that's it is uh, it, it's it's crazy. It's a very scary yeah. situation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because yeah. so, you know, I know that, with that, mine, two of mine, I almost died having them. I have three kids, and two of them I almost died, and I was sent home with some. Oh. I didn't take any just because I was breastfeeding and whatever, but yeah, and there, are, there, are, there are, there are certainly personalities who can handle it. I was not one of them. Mm. The moment I, yeah. the moment I took one, I, I knew I, I, I tell a story in AA that when I was in eighth grade or seventh or eighth grade, I got high for the first time. The first time I really got high. And, mm. um, and I, I remember it was a night, I kind of remember where I was, but I learned three things. One is I love this. I want more. And the third thing, which was most dangerous is I have to keep this a secret or I won't, or I won't get it anymore. Mm -hmm. And, and right. that, that's kind of like, yeah, you know, it's a, it, it hardwired me at a very young age. Wow. That's, that's, uh -huh. that's something there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, you know what it is? It's secrets. Yeah. Yeah. The secrets I, kill you. I, I remember that being probably, yeah. I, I'm going to guess I was probably nine years old, uh, 10 years old, stole a bottle out of the back behind the seat of a pickup truck of my, uh, one of our family friends who was like uh, an active alcoholic. He just had wine like everybody does in, behind their pickup truck. And finding a bottle and uh, stealing it, walking out into the snow 
and drinking as much as I could, putting it in the snow and then uh, coming back to it later and then panicking because I couldn't find it for a minute and then yeah. finding it and saying, oh, <laughs> you know, and not wanting, you know, not talking to anybody about that, you know. So. Yeah. Uh, I had a, a pretty interesting experience a couple of weeks ago. I was at a, um, it was about a month ago. I was at a recovery center with some of the bulldogs and someone talked very emotionally about the horror of being so such a bad drinker that she drove home and then woke up and didn't know how she got home. And if, and I'm, I was just sitting there, you know, I'm at, the, I go to these meetings all the time mm -hmm. and, and if you had a camera on my face, I was, I was like a stone, you know, but my mm -hmm. eyebrow just went up because it was like, wait, but that happened once. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. That's well, what I was thinking. Problem? I was like, okay. And then what when, happened? Yeah. When I was, when I was in high school, <laughs> kids would call and say, Hey, do you want to go drinking? And I'd be like, I can't, I don't have a car, you know, because you can't drink without driving. You know, it was just like, Oh my God. But, but it was, it, you know, that which was normal then mm. is it, not, it took a while to realize that that's not so normal. Yeah. That's not so normal. <laughs> yeah. <It's> not. yeah. <laughs> it is amazing what we can normalize. What we know? normalize. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That's awesome. Well, um, Jim, thank you so much for uh, oh. joining us tonight. Um, you know, it was good to yeah, hear. Yeah, Jim, about... this was wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Really appreciated this. This was awesome. Oh. Yeah. I'll stand by my comment in the first half hour where I said, thank was, you. You know, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Jim. Well, I think it's thank interesting you. and important, right? It's both. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, this is quite the, and quite the podcast here. you got here. Thank yeah. you. You're, you're very welcome. It's we, we try to have a lot of fun and we also try to keep it real and, and talk about, you know, talk about things without a filter and, um, and do things that hopefully will help, you know, I know tonight there's going to be somebody who listened to this and who is going to identify with something, whether it's, um, you know, whether it's the opioid thing or whether it's, uh, you know, the running part of it to, um, you know, to get them back, to get them back to the, you know, doing something that's good for themselves. So, um, awesome. or, you know, yeah. so and, and, and even and, if it's one person, that's a win. That's a huge. Win. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. And like you said, it's not just, you know, it, a club like this, it's not just about helping just the addicts or just the people in recovery. It's also their families and their yes. friends. And it's yes. such a yeah. prevalent situation in our society that affects everybody. Exactly. So mm. if we can find something that will help, you know, yeah. anybody in that. Mm. There's a multiplier effect to every, awesome. you know, every interaction. Exactly. You you think about it, you know, if if I weren't sober, you know, my wife never saw me drink, my kids never saw me drink. Um and, wow. and I come from like seven or eight generations as far as I can tell of alcoholics. So um hmm. the fact that just that opportunity is there. Now I have my own dysfunction and I've certainly cursed my kids with yeah whatever that yeah. turns out to be, you know, their own trauma that they've gotten from me, but hopefully it's a little bit less than what I experienced from yeah. my, it is no doubt it's less than what I experienced in my family life. So, yeah, I, I, there is something to this too, that, that um, I feel in the Bulldogs that we've all been touched by the same pain. Mm. And, and when you meet somebody who's been touched by similar pain, they know that, you know, mm. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. it, it humanizes everything, you know, it's mm -hmm. like, and, and I think the more we talk about it, the more connections we realize it's like, it might not be drugs and alcohol, but it might be gambling mm -hmm. and it might, or it might be shopping mm -hmm. or it might be, you know, it might be food, mm -hmm. you know, but when people start, I, I think that's how we form other, other forms, other ways of building community. Yeah. And unless you're, unless you have that community, yep. you're in it alone. You're and alone. like, what, what is, yeah. you know, nothing can yeah. be sadder than a glass of wine alone. Right. But, but like isn't that what AA says? Mm. Isn't, isn't that what AA does is it makes you realize you're not alone. Mm. This thing, this experience that you had. Oh, no, no. Right. 
others having this. Yes. In fact, yes. you're telling the story I had. You're telling my story. That's right. Yeah. yeah. I used to think that my sponsor paid people to tell my story. I was like, oh, I was like, just bite me. You're bringing this guy up here telling my story. Like, okay. Like, all right fine you know i was completely convinced that they had yeah, you had the bottle of wine at age 10 come on that was yeah. me yeah. yeah 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 that was me you stole that story from me <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I did my 90 days 90 and 90 uh and i think that i think it was like my 90th meeting i looked at the wall and there were the promises of aa mm -hmm. and i read through the promises and i went oh my god it's a cult Oh my God, it's a cult, yeah. <laughs> and um, and and because it was it was just too unbelievable. It was mm. too outrageous. Had it yeah. had it said, and everyone will win a million dollars, you know. Yeah. And and I fear have of to economic tell you, insecurity will leave you. But but I have to tell you, it has all come true. Yeah, yeah. It really has all come true. It is. It is. You know, it it sucks. It, and and if you're going through a tough time right now. It's a long moment in your long life. It's a short moment in your long life. Mm -hmm. Remember that. It, it mm -hmm. feels like it's going on forever, but it's really just a short mo moment in your long life. You'll get through this. Mm. Right on. I think that's a great way to leave it. Yep. Um, you know, so uh, there are, <laughs> for if you've made it this far, uh, of course, seek professional help. And we will see you all in a mile. Mile and, Mile and a half. All right. All right. All right. Hello everyone. It's me. Cultra Bot. The bot with a lot. Want to hear a joke? Here goes. I wanted to run an ultra marathon, but I could not hard drive that far. Get it? Hard drive. Ha dot ha ha. I am here to let you know about our excellent Patreons who help support the show. Support is good. We are 112% listener supported. If you want. You could also try supporting the Boston Bulldogs. You know it wouldn't kill you to be nice. Was that rude? Or Cultra Bot just be being direct? If you are not a Patreon, be sure to thank one, next time you see them. Here we go. Hashtag Hundo Joe support Hundo's happy hour, whatever that means to you. Carrot dollar 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 Albert James Galayton 113th mile Impressive, but is it even possible? A Marcus up Amy Jennifer Hanlon AJH Amy Jennifer Hanlon's friend AJHF Amy Mower Power Amy Sorensen always on the path Andy did nothing but a flesh wound. Angela Rose by any other name. Anna G, high energy. Antone de Betancourt. Austin Frank. Azam Palatov. Ben Millet. Ben 1N. Benjamin Griffin. Berkshire Trailheads. Basic Hustle has been grinding all his life. Bikini Chicken. Bill Gibbs still a baragain. Bill Gilpatrick the Patriotic Patreon, so stand up and salute and buy war bonds. Uncle Sam needs you. Bill Adendal and the War Amug. Whoa whoa listen to Brian Musiak. Brian O. Bryce Hen Ellie. Celeste Fong. Cherie Bilby. Chocolate Lee Oatmeal Raisin Chip 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 Chip, Chip Hooray. Chris Russell. Kristina Chinhing. Christopher Michael Colangelo Clement Scented Chunks Cloris Reinhardt Crutch Lee Dan Braveheart David Hoople David Hyde Seeks David Kaplan Ellen Cretella Patella Connell 
Eli Pellegrino is a tall drink of water. Emily Meyer, rules Culture City. Enrique Tello. Eric Wester, celebrating Easter. Franklin Gondiaga. Fred Wills and Trusts, available on retainer, allegedly. Fuck Arby's. Jeffrey Miller. Heidi Stearns and Foster, woof woof, who's a good buddy. J.J. Durand Durand Master of the Running Band. Jack. Eye of the Tiger. Smith. Jacques Sarbach, pain is just another word for, nothing left to bread. Jake the Coco Coteen. Jamie the Miler. Just Jank. Jessica Crandallways. Jillian L. F. Stonian Institution. Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Trail Charts. Joseph Morris Rowe. Just a plotter plotting, bashing through the woods, like a godder, godding. Justin Koski. Karen Plato. Kelsey Engineer. Lanzo Lotto. Laura Ricci, meow, meow, Fred's cat's favorite. Sophia. Lauren Edelman. Law Dog. E Dog. Leanne Zarger. Lenny's mom, went to the prom, and drank a glass of water, Lenny sat up, like a good little pup, then danced like he was on blotter. Liz Vicious 30. Meshij Macho. Mark W. Kelly. Rat. A tat. 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 Marty Dutchell. Matt Nilsson. Michael Keogh. Michael Lopresti. Michelle Pom Pom Pom. Pom O'Neill. Microscopic Porcupine. Mike Reardong. Miles Victorious. Mommy Craigery. Monkey Stuffer. N. A. May. Nat Zilsk. Nicole Cash and Carey. Once a Runner. Peter Keo. Powered by Pop Tarts. Rebecca Gonzalez Kreisberg. Richard Runs Trails on YouTube Once Upon a Time Finishes Traveler 100. Rob the Bear Asperekin Ridge. Ron Lokendro. Ross Bielak. Rufus and Brenda Chaffee Ford and Chaffee Chocolatey Chickens Chasing Cats. Run the Whites at Midnight. Rusty Red Wagon. Samuel Dibdal. Suing and Crewing, Sarah Porus. Big Scott Johnson. Simon C. Edge it up on East Rock. Slurpee Runner. Steep Endurance. Stephen Extreme Estramera. Tai Tai. Ten Junk Miles. Get Some While Supplies Last. The Blue Hills Contingent. The Lazarus Crew. Tom the Destroyer Stradag. Tony DDD Didamizio. Tunxus Jamie McCusker. Ultra Walker Taking on the Cut 112. Walt Hamer and Anvil. William Keep Running Bro on YouTube Jarrah. Smee Cook Desired in the Rear. Well. That's it. Thank you for your support. Subpert is good. And for keeping your humble robot employed. I will be so sad when this is over. So for now. This is Cultra Bot Out. Fuck. Oh my fuck.